Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Geochem. Okay gang, so now that we've really gotten our feet wet with some heterocycles and those three in particular, you know, whether they're just themselves or they're, they're derivatives, I'm talking about parole, furan, and thiophene. I always have trouble for remembering that name for some reason. Anyways, now that we got some experience with those, what I wanna do is kind of take that new knowledge we have and fuse it together with some old knowledge we have. So let's do some EAS reactions, right? So we mentioned that furan, perol, and thiophene are aromatic. So there's no surprise that we can do electrophilic aromatic substitution with those molecules. And if you're a little dust, you know, rusty and you need to brush the dust off, that's what I wanted to say, on the, that concept, remember, electrophilic aromatic substitution. We're going to substitute electrophiles onto aromatic things, right? So we're gonna put positive things on our aromatic systems, which clearly have a lot of negative charge because there's that system of delocalized electrons. <clears throat> so if we just take a very generic, and if you're looking at this word up here, I think you can tease this apart, right? But heterocyclopentadienes is kind of a really generic way to refer to parole, furan, and thiophene because, right, heterocycle, that means we have an atom that's, we have two or more atoms in our ring, and it's cyclo, there you go, well, yeah, cyclo, there's five, and then there's, a, you know, two double bonds, like, two double bonds, right? So that's how we get the heterocyclopentadiene, right? A mouthful. So if we're looking at this, right, clearly we can see that we have symmetry here and here, and here and here. So when you refer on the ring, this is C2, actually C2, C3, C4, and C5. You start numbering it too because technically there's five things in your ring, right? So this is kind of like unofficial one, you know? So C2 and C5 here are symmetrical and same with C3 and C4. So when we introduce an electrophile to the mix, and I'll use something concrete in an example to come, where does it go? Where, what kind of regiochemistry should we expect, right? So what's gonna happen, we, we can, let's evaluate both circumstances. Let's kind of deal with C, well, yeah, I'll, I'll number this way. Like, let's consider C2 and C3. Well, let's kind of do the C2 scenario right here. So we know this is gonna happen. Our double bond is gonna grab the electrophile, the lover of negative charge, and we're going to force a carbocation either here or here. So I'm saying this will be like, we will, um, the attack is at C2. So what that means is we have this situation going on. So I'll put my electrophile at C2, which means I have a carbocation on C3. Basically what we're gonna figure out, which position is favored by which resonance we incur being the most favorable. Does that make sense? We're gonna basically stick this electrophile where the intermediate we produce is the most stable. So clearly I can draw some resonance. What I can do is I can bop this over here. Didn't touch the electrophile at all. I have a double bond here now, and I have a plus charge right there. And wouldn't you know it, I'm gonna have at least one lone pair here no matter what I'm dealing with, whether it be nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur, right? So I can then do this. So we're looking pretty strong in this scenario because we seem to have quite a bit of resonance going on, right? But oh, let's evaluate what happens when we do attack at C3. Okay, so what that means is we will have electrophile here. I have a bond here, my double bond is gone there, and I have a plus charge right here. So I have at least one lone pair there. I will be able to swing this down. Double bond. Electrophile, didn't touch this. Oh, oh, okay. And we're stuck, okay? So actually, when we do attack at C3, we only have two resonance forms. But you can see and when we do attack at C2, we get three. So what you're going to see, again, it can change slightly when you add groups. However, however, when you have you know, a very default case like this. 
or if you know you, you can have outkill change off off there, it doesn't matter. You're always going to do attack at C2 when you do electrophilic aromatic substitutions. So this this I feel like could be a really good like theory question on a test. Like explain why you know EIS reactions put substituents on C2 versus C3 when you're dealing with heterocyclopentadienes. However, right things are always more fun when they're concrete, and we have firm examples. So let me clean this up. I'll show you two examples, and then after that we'll do one kind of theory or like kind of interesting thought problem, and then we'll call it quits. But let me clean this up and we'll get after it. Okay gang, so let's look at a few complete the reaction questions. Okay, so if we turn to the first one, we have parole, and we're gonna toss this thing in right here. Oh, and I forgot charge right here, sorry about that. What I hope you can just see here is that this is basically going to give us NO2 minus, and right, if we even expand that from our old Benzene days, we're basically going to be sticking on a nitro group, but it looks like, whoop, just kidding, not NO2, NO2 plus, I apologize, NO2 plus, oof, that was a bad mistake. Okay, so NO2 plus, that's what's gonna come from here. So we're basically gonna lose this chunk and have this right here. It might even do something like that. Regardless, that's what we're gonna stick on, and based on the analysis we just did, we know we're gonna get our major product at this position, which is something I do wanna highlight I actually have some percentages for you here. So this can be like a 50% yield at C2, but, so that's our major, not an amazing yield, but a yield nonetheless. And you can have something at C3, but the yield's much lower, 13%. So these are just some example percentages when this has been done in real life. But you can see clearly the, you know, based on the fact that we get more resonance forms when we attach our electrophile at C2, we get three, versus the two resonance forms when we attach to C3, and that's, you know, we can see that tangibly through the reaction percentages, okay? This one is much more straightforward. This is a nice breath of fresh air, nice nostalgia. Clearly, we're just gonna attach a chlorine right here if we're gonna predict our major product. Super straightforward. Nothing to worry about, okay? I do want to do one more example. I like it because, oh, I kissed the marker. I like it because uh, it's more of a thought experiment. It's, it's almost like, we're basically gonna see something where we have a substituent already added and it's gonna to talk about what's going to happen next. So, hang tight, I'm gonna do some tidying up and then we'll do one more example. Okay, gang, one more example and then we'll lay EAS to rest with our heterocyclopentadienes. Okay, so if we take a look up here. This problem is given as such. We have this thiophene derivative. Clearly we see, so if, if we look at it right now, we can, because this is going this way, gives this substituent a lower number. This is C2, this is C3, C4, C5, and so on, okay? Awesome. So, basically we are trying to do bromination on this thi thiophene derivative with this nitrile already there, and we only get one product. Now, again, it's not like, what I want to clarify about this is that we're not predicting a major or a minor, is that we discussed that when we were doing our reactions before, like say, the chlorination of furan, we knew we were gonna work at C2, but C2 could've, you know, we could've numbered either way since we had symmetry here. Now, we actually have two positions, right, where the, we know the resonance would work out either way, C2 and C5 are actually not symmetrical here, okay? So there's a little bit more going on because we have this nitrile group from the get-go, all right? So what I wanna do is, you know, of course, resonance, but, you know, place a bromine in C2, place a bromine in C5, and see if we can figure out why only one product is formed. Clearly, in the resonance, we're gonna see something that's unfavorable uh, with one addition versus the other, okay? So let's do C2. So if I add at C2, I'm gonna have something like this. Uh, sulfur, no double bond, of the nitrile, of the bromine, okay. And that places a positive charge on C3, okay? So then I can draw resonance like this. Sulfur, 
nitrile, no bond, bromine, and our positive charge then moves to C5. And we got one more with sulfur donating its electrons right there. And so we clock in at three resonance structures. Sorry, struggling on the five membered ring drawing chain. Bromine, nitrile, double bond. All right, there we go, three. So let's draw C5 and then we'll compare. We do our addition to C5. Switch the colors to make them all obvious. Sulfur, so we got bromine over here now. We got our double bond here, we got nitrile right here. And we got our positive charge at C4. Oh, I'm sorry, gang. Yikes, 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 yikes. Poof, I was like brain blast for a second. Not a good way. So, here's why I was so confused. Now we can swing this over. That, everything makes sense in the world again. Sulfur, bromine hasn't been touched. We got the double one here, we got the nitrile right there. Double the positive charge moves to C2. And once again, we can use sulfur to swing down an electron lone pair to make a double bond. We draw this one more time, hopefully not forgetting anything. Nitrile, double bond, double bond, positive charge, and bromine. Okay, so let's compare. So we each have three resonance structures, so it's not a difference in how much resonance is available, but let's look at the quality of the resonance, okay? So what I, what I want to highlight, and again, this also is from our benzene, our initial benzene knowledge, right? Is that what is, what is nitrile, right? We see that if we're looking at our aromatic system, what is considered to be it, right? It's the cyclopentadiene, the heterocyclopentadiene right here, right? This is a extremely, partial positive, you're partially positive carbon because it's triple bonded to a nitrogen that is just vampire sucking all of its positive charge out of it, right? Well, that means that this carbon is also going to be trying to, you know, suck electron density out of the right. This is an EWG. This is an electron withdrawing group, right? So the fact of the matter is, is that carbon is partially positive. Well, if we look at the resonance here, one thing I'm going to try and see is is there a positive charge put next door to that carbon? Because if so, those like charges are going to repel each other. And if you look at C2, the very first charge we incur is one next, we have a partial positive carbon right next door to a formally charged carbon, right? So this is kind of a, a sad face. And if you see in the residence below, we have no such problem down here. So my, you know, as a result, the major product is that we add at C5. In this case, where C5 and C2 are not symmetrical, we add bromine here. Okay, so I hope that made sense. And again, this is there was really nothing different based on the new knowledge we learned, right? That was analysis you could have done when you learned EAS the first time around. So, but it, it, you know, it's important, right? We drew back from our, our prior experience because we needed to know that we needed to recognize that was an electron withdrawing group and that, you know, like charges repel. Okay, gang, thank you for taking yet another trip down memory lane. This time, our previous memory lane trip with EAS combined with our brand new knowledge of heterocycles. If you like the video, please like it. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you do neither of those things, I'm very excited to, regardless, see you in the next video.